All right, here we are with episode number seven, Chris King today, and we're thrilled. Uh, Next Level Solutions, we're here in the headquarters of Chris offices right here is next to us. So, Chris, thank you for coming today. Hey, thanks for coming. Glad to, to your have office. <laughs> yeah, my headquarters. <laughs> the headquarters Gabe's describing is a three thousand square foot one story building. So, uh, don't don't have any any big images of corporate offices here. <laughs> well, we're thrilled to have you. We're going to be talking today about personal growth, business growth, and one thing that gets me really excited is that Chris is is great. Um, man of faith, a great uh, leader, business leader. And in the past three years, they've grown immensely. I mean, it's it's unbelievable the amount of progress and traction that they got in the business. So Chris, uh, let's go ahead and and tell the audience about Next Level and how you guys uh, got started with this. Sure. So great maybe in my efforts. I'm not so sure in my results of a great man of faith. <laughs> I, I try my best. And so, yeah, I think one of the one of the most important things you brought up faith. One of the most important things that that has allowed us to flourish is that our business is built on a foundation of faith. We, uh, we view our business first and foremost as a ministry. That doesn't mean that we're a nonprofit. We do operate for profit, but we, we're very generous with those profits. And if we see the right situation, the right attitude, and, and the right potential, we will invest heavily in someone that doesn't have any resources to pay us. So uh, that's really kind of given us a unique approach to what we do. And, and what we do is... Uh, we serve small businesses, and so that's why I was kind of uh, laughing at the the headquarters reference because we are a small business too that serves small businesses, and um, that segment of the market is really underserved. Most consulting firms or professional services firms, if you will, most of them go after large opportunities. They go after companies that that can afford to pay big bill rates and so forth. And what makes us a little unique, number one, is our the skill sets that we combine between our three areas of the business. But what also makes us unique is that we're willing to work with any small business's budget to help them accomplish their goals. And, uh, that and that's accounting, IT. Yeah, yeah. So we are uh, we're a full service IT company. Everything you would imagine that would come along with that, from pulling cable infrastructure, Wi-Fi networks, uh, complex Wi-Fi networks. We've done several campgrounds and large, you know, covering large areas, websites, graphic design, branding, and server administration, end user training, workstation maintenance. I mean, you name it. If it's got a plug, we even do some tele we don't we don't sell or install telephone systems, but we're we're competent in in troubleshooting those and working with those types of things. So we like to say if it has a, a wire attached to it, we're we'll mess with it. So that's uh, that's one third of our business, and then the other uh, two thirds are one of the silos is accounting. Uh, we're a full service accounting group. We do everything from contract CFO work down to data entry. So we have several clients that we are their accounting department, and um, that that one's pretty simple to describe because that's what we're doing day in and day out is accounting and and uh, we're we're prepared. We're not a CPA. We're not a tax preparer, but we work in the business, helping the business owner to organize that data, run the business with that data, and then we make a CPA's job really easy at year end because things are nice and clean. They can come in, ask a few questions, and prepare tax returns. And then the uh, the other part of the business is operation support. And we joke around with that partner because he pretty much does everything else. <laughs> Jeff Oquan is a uh, licensed health insurance agent. Uh, he's Series 7 licensed and uh, gives him understanding into company benefits, health insurance plans, 401ks, HR. You know, we do HR for a lot of companies, operations assistance with them and their workflows and, and the way they do things, policies and procedures, that kind of thing. So we're, you know, if you, if you think about it, if you're listening out there, you're probably saying, well, man, these guys are trying to be everything to everybody. And we're not trying to be everything to everybody, but we proudly say that we are trying to be everything to a struggling small business. We're not a solution for a big company. 
we're a solution for small business. Our largest client does about fifty million a year, and our smallest is a startup. So that kind of gives you an idea of the range of the companies we work with. Wonderful. Now, take us back about three years ago. Is that right? Three years ago when you got started, you mentioned that you started at your kitchen. Yeah. And that's how. Yeah. So you mentioned, uh, I don't know if we mentioned the Dave. I'm a big fan of Dave Ramsey. And one of the things Dave always talks about is how he started his business on his, at, his, at a card table in his living room. And yes, we did. We started at our kitchen tables. And, you know, when you start at your kitchen table, you've got to be crafty when you're out there trying to find those first clients because when they want to know where your office is, you've got to have a pretty unique explanation as to why you don't have an office. And uh, originally ours was that, and it was true, we wanted to keep our overhead low so we could keep our costs low as low as possible. So in other words, we, we weren't charging enough to be able to afford an office building. And it wasn't until we actually had several clients that we were able to make the step and, and have a nice place. Now, you guys were working separately as consultants in different arenas, the three main partners of, of the company today. And then suddenly, what happened? Why you guys decided to? Yes. Yeah, so I had, back in 2008, I had followed an opportunity to be a youth director at a local church. And that's when I started doing my consulting work. And so I had one client, and then that one client turned into a handful. And I didn't really have any cards or market. It didn't have a marketing effort. It was just word of mouth. And uh, so I was a contract CFO, and that kind of helped me refine and develop my model a little bit as I began to bring on people to help me, lower cost resources that could help and work with clients. And then my partner, Jeff Oquin, I had a business called Cost Management Solutions where for over 20 years he's been on and off uh, working with, with businesses and helping them reduce their cost of operations and kind of a more operations focus focused effort on his part and then of course in there he was he was dealing with investments and insurance throughout that as well and then my partner Sean Goble back about the same time that I started that I became a youth director and and started doing some work on my own he started his own little IT shop and uh, just much like our clients we all struggled because we were good at what we did and, you know, Sean, for example, was great with computers, but his books were a disaster. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, just uh, like to say I'm fairly technologically competent. Sean would laugh at me and tell me I don't know anything, <laughs> but I know more than the average bear. But, but I could never, we could never be an IT, I could never have an IT company without, without him. And, and quite honestly, in our own business, having him as a resource doing that. And the same thing applies to Jeff. We all work together to strengthen our own company, just like we do our clients. Yeah. Now here at the show, we usually cover the five M, which is mentors, business model, money, market, and management. So we, we kind of talk about small business being the market that you guys are pursuing and uh, management. You guys have Something very interesting that I would love to share uh, that you guys have the silos and you operate in, in this main areas, IT, accounting and operations. And so you want to share with us more about management? Sure. Yeah. So um, I guess our business model is the three headed monster. Our company, you know, we're structured. If you look at our logo, there's a, a CFO block, a COO and a CIO block. And we're structured like an executive team would wrap around a CEO and a small business. And uh, there is, so we, we don't provide the CEO function in a small business. And what we've done since inception, and it's actually worked quite well, is uh, we each run our individual silos. So we have full decision-making authority within, within our silos. If it's a decision that affects our whole company, we meet weekly as, a, a, as partners and uh, we make those decisions as a group. And uh, if something has to, if a, if a decision has to be made quickly, we don't really have a lot of that to begin with because we usually plan pretty well and we try to run our business instead of having our business run us. So there are not many situations 
where we have to make a decision on the spot. But if we if we do, it only takes two of us because we're we're th- uh, three equal partners. So uh, that's the way we run our business, and I would say that is probably very unique. But we uh, we have a very healthy partnership, and we we have a solid operating agreement that we thought out well before we started the business and we live by that operating agreement and so when you when you have those understandings going into business it makes doing business pretty easy so uh i know that's one uh, yeah for small businesses that's one big challenge when they're starting now and they want to partner it up with somebody either a family or a friend and they either going to have a terrible nightmare <laughs> or they're going to have success so I want to expand on that if you want to share some advice for small business owners that are thinking and partnering with someone, what would you tell them to do? Yeah, the, fir- the first thing I would do, well, I think, I think the mistake a lot of business owners make is uh, if you picture somebody pulling up to the beach on summer vacation and, and they just see the, the water and they just start running toward the water and they're stripping their clothes off and boom they're in the water well next thing you know they didn't see the sign that said sharks in water don't swim because they went too fast and business is a lot like that and we we see that a lot where we go into a company that that may be in a disastrous situation and a lot of it is just because the entrepreneur is so excited about doing business that they don't plan properly. They, they just run straight in and dive in the water. So the best advice that I could give anybody is take time and do an operating agreement. If you're going to have a partnership, 50-50 partnerships are difficult. You guys are in a 50-50 uh, yeah, we're 50, working on it. Yeah. 50 partnership. Mm-hmm. That's a difficult partnership to be in. And if you're going to do that, you got to find a way for somebody to be able to, you got to have a tiebreaker. Is that what happens between the three of you guys? Somebody, yeah. That, okay. And you, you would think, you would think that you know Jeff and I have known each other the longest. Uh, although Sean and I have been friends for eight or nine years, but, but Jeff and I have been friends for over twenty years. You would think that, oh, well, Jeff and I just side on everything. No, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> We've had it end up every way you can think about it. And so um, those things that you think aren't going to be a problem, they come up and bite you and you got to, you got to have a way to resolve conflict. So take the time and, and have a uh, well thought out plan about how you're going to handle if one of you goes to jail, how are you going to handle if one of you gets sick of the other and wants to buy them out or, or if you just can't work together, how are you, how are, you got to plan the divorce before you get married. So partnerships are really, really, really difficult. And uh, that would be, you know, my advice would be to just have a plan, talk about it in advance, talk about how you're going to handle things and and go out. And um, you don't need to go get an attorney right off the bat and have some big expensive operating agreement drawn up. Just put your thoughts down on on the back of a napkin, on a Word document, and begin to build, talk to some people, get ideas about what are things that, you know, that could possibly happen and get your thoughts down before you go to an attorney on what you want that operating agreement to say. And the other advice I would give you is if you have an operating agreement and you can't read it and understand what it says, then you don't have an operating agreement. I mean, we've had, we have literally had clients bring in operating agreements that were done by expensive professional attorneys and they've asked us to review them and I I mean after reviewing them I've come back and said can you summarize what this thing says to me and they can't because of the the language and so make sure you can read it it's more important that that the operating agreement accurately reflects what your what your agreement is as partners than it is for it to look fancy and sound fancy with a bunch of language you don't understand Sure. And, and um, in regards to decision making, how do you guys handle that? I know this room is usually where you guys meet on Thursdays every week. That's you right. Got, you got your partner yeah. meeting. That's right. <laughs> but let's say that, you know, Jeff has this initiative or this idea and he want to go, you know, implement this or buy this, which is yeah. what usually what happens. So how do you guys decide? Yeah, it's a, it's a lot of fun when that happens because whether it's me or whether it's one of them, we come into the room and we're all excited about our idea and the other two guys just stare at you for a little while. But, you know, it's good though, because two heads are better than one and three are better than two. So when we come in and want to spend money on something or, or want to make a move in a certain direction, 
it's nice to have to go through two other guys that uh two other business people who are gonna who are gonna shoot holes in your idea so that way if you if you do go forward you've got three people on board that that have all thought it through uh so that's uh so if the two of them they say no chris we don't think this is a good idea then it doesn't happen yep I don't, i don't get what i want then all right That's what about a, if Jeff say yes and then Sean doesn't approve it? If, it still if, guys if move? Two, two out of three. There you go. <laughs> two out of three. So, uh, yeah, we and it's happened that way a lot. And so, and once again, though, that goes back to the partnership agreement. That's what we agreed on. So I don't have a problem with being voted down because I've had it go in my favor before where I wanted something and somebody else didn't. And it's just part of being grown up and being in a, a healthy relationship. Great. So we covered so far management, market, and now we have money and, and model. Before we jump into money and we talk about Dave Ramsey and all of that good stuff, <laughs> the business model. I mean, we talk about the silos. We talk about now management and how do you guys make decisions. But in regards to profit distribution, where do you guys get to, to share the rewards of your hard work? Can you walk us through Let's say, you know, let's say you guys build, let's round it up to $100,000 this year, uh, which is nothing, but let's, let's work with those numbers. How do you guys then go about a profit distribution? Is that quarterly or annually? Sure. So um, so at this point, we're, we're in year three or we're in year four of being in business. So uh, as as a group with the three of us. So uh, it so far, it's just been it's been an annual thing where we just sit down at the end of the year. And of course, our our compensation, uh, you know, with this one mistake that a lot of entrepreneurs make and why businesses don't make it is people people get into business and they draw a salary from a company that doesn't have the money to pay them a salary. And so from the beginning, our compensation is based off of our billable time. We don't get paid anything. We've gotten, we've gotten paid zero for our sweat equity and our time that is spent running the business, meeting, doing our own accounting, doing our own marketing events and those kinds of things. I mean, we don't get paid for that, which has really allowed our company to be strong from the beginning because it's, it's kind of been a, a mandated We, we've mandated profit. We're we're gonna we're gonna make money. Is, is it a percentage? So you guys say, okay, we want at least. No, we we have a we have a set we have a set amount per billable hour that we each work, and and we're each on the honor system. Mm -hmm. um, we we work within our silos, but of course we gauge the profitability of each silo. So you know, I make what I make, and Sean makes what he makes, and Jeff makes what he makes based off of billable time. But at the end of the day. We're, we're each accountable to each other for the amount of margin that we bring to the table from each of our silos to, to pay for our overhead. So, yeah, at the end of the year, I mean, we, it's a matter of deciding how much do we we always want to leave money in the company to reinvest in the company, which we kind of do that throughout the year as we buy equipment or, or advertise or spend money on events whatever that is but at the end of the year that we it's just a three-way split of whatever we decide we want to take out and you know anybody that started a business been in business knows that in year four we're we're just now on the at the point where it's going to get fun because <laughs> uh, it's been a struggle yeah. you know it's been a struggle from the beginning we've all made a good we've all made a good living but you know there hadn't been a lot of of big distributions at year end and, and once again that ties back into our model and who we serve and we're just these these aren't big fat deals that we're doing i mean we're out there our, our mission statement is to help companies and help people and leave them better than we found them so nowhere in there does it say make x amount of dollars profit uh, become wealthy so uh, we just feel like if we serve people well though that that the profitability will, will come and So hopefully we can do this, have this, carry this discussion on next January, and uh, this year is shaping up to be a pretty good year. So we'll we'll let you know how that definitely we'll, out. Definitely, <laughs> we'll definitely follow up on that. But I think it's key to cover that. Just seeing a whole lot of small businesses out there and young entrepreneurs as well that they get some momentum, they are bringing revenue, but they want to reinvest everything. They don't pay themselves a salary, and they don't they don't take profit. They're reinvesting in their business and maybe they they draw some money to pay some some of their expenses which is something 
uh, it's, it's a mistake as well, right? It's uh, kind of like a common, often mistake that they use. No, it for. I mean it's not a it's not a mistake to draw money to pay your bills. Right. Well, well, what I say money. is like use uh, business money just to pay for personal stuff. Oh you should yeah, pay you got to keep you got to keep your stuff straight. You got to separate business from personal. That's a whole other discussion. But no, I'm I'm not saying it's a bad idea to take money to because I've certainly taken money out to pay bills and take care of my family, and I've got two kids in private school and a daughter in college and they bleed me dry so but I, but but my point is that that you can't take money out of a business that the business doesn't have yeah. so if you're starting a business and your revenues are are five thousand dollars a month and your operating expenses are four thousand a month you can't take a four thousand dollar a month salary and live off of a line of credit i mean you're you're setting yourself up for failure if you do that so that that's my only point is just draw out make sure make sure you're you're bringing in enough revenue and profit to be able to pay yourself out of that yeah and still leave some money in the company and and with this profit first that we've been talking about lately a whole lot and profit first it's just this framework or methodology where you pretty much you Let's say you bring in five thousand dollars, and this guy he suggests that you take your profit first, which is something I'll share with you that later. But uh, for you guys, you can definitely uh, check it out. Profit first, just Google it, and and the book covers that. But he talks about healthy businesses versus you know this whole big business. That, yeah, we're bringing millions of dollars, but there's no profit. Right. Why? Because we're reinvesting and growing, and then that keeps going for three, five years and never yeah. happens. That's right. Yeah. Uh, now, and, and that, that's something that we can see a lot with small businesses. So let's see. So we got so far cover the fir the first four M's and this one it's fun. I know you're a big fan of the run. So we talk about that money and I wanted to take a time and, and discuss why personal finances are critical for an entrepreneur. And you know, if, if an entrepreneur starts a business and their his finance his or her finances are broken or they are into really huge debt then their business most likely are going to be in trouble. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, so, uh, so yes, personal finance is very, is uh, something that I'm very passionate about. I am a huge fan of Dave Ramsey. And uh, the reason I am is because his material changed my marriage, changed my life. My wife and I have the same dreams and goals. We talk about them and we, we operate in that direction. Also, as a person of faith, I believe it all belongs to God and that we're managers of what, what God has blessed us with. And so managing your own money personally and, and uh, you know, when I say managing it, it's simply spending less than you make, not being overextended, not trying to keep up with the culture, and being generous, you know, learning to give. And I, I think those are very foundational principles that, that set you up to be a successful entrepreneur. Because what, what you do in your personal life is going to spill over into your business life. So if you can't balance your own checkbook and keep track of receipts, if you, you make $10,000 a month and you're spending $14,000 a month in your household, how in the world are you going to run an organization and manage the money that, that's there? So um, it's, it's very important to us, and those habits spill over. So. Yeah, and Dave Ramsey, I mean, you, you guys can definitely check out, just Google Dave Ramsey, you're going to have a whole lot of yeah. co good content and the, the podcast and the radio show that that he does. And you, you start um, following Dave uh, a couple of years ago, what, five years, ten no, years? No, it's been a long time. So originally, back when I started working in youth ministry, uh, this had to be around 2003 or four. Very good friend of mine. His name is George Ragsdale. He's the director of youth ministries at uh, at my church. And actually now he's the director of a lot of other stuff too. But at the time he came to me and uh, I was teaching a Sunday school class for seniors in high school. And uh, he said, you know, hey, I want you to try out this curriculum. It's called Generation Change. And so it was Dave Ramsey's college or um, high school, you know, material for Sunday's Sunday school classes. And so I, I was exposed to it there. And, uh, you know, like everybody else, I sat back and I kind of uh, I said, yeah, you know, he's got some good, he got some good points. And I agree with this and I don't agree with that. And um, I kind of picked and choose what I 
what I, you know, I thought I was smarter than just blindly following someone else's principles. And then I realized those principles that he's, that he's teaching are biblical principles. So it's not really Dave Ramsey's stuff. It's, it's what God teaches us about money. And it wasn't until about four or five years ago, my wife and I went through Financial Peace University together. So up until that point, I was familiar with all the concepts, but I didn't didn't really live them. And uh, found myself sixty thousand dollars in credit card debt, car loans, and just my wife and I just looked at each other and said, "This is ridiculous." And we just made a decision that that we weren't going to live that way anymore. And uh, we we're we're all in. And so it's been the smartest thing we've ever done. And and because of that, now we've started our business that way. Our business started debt free. We don't have any debt. We're not going to have debt. And we're just going to grow slow and organically. And if we don't have the money to buy it, we're, we're not going to do it. And when you do it that way and the stuff hits the fan, it's, you know, you sleep a lot better at night when you're not trying to, to please the bank or make your payments. So, yeah, that's. That's where I'm at on that. Yeah, morning. it's fantastic. And guys, uh, my time is coming to an end, but I just want to thank you, Chris. Uh, Chris has been in the past year and a half a great role model for me. And I don't, I don't tell this a lot to him, but he's been definitely somebody that I look after and that I model. And we've been working together since January last year. He was one of the first clients here in Baton Rouge. And man, I seen it. I remember there was the, the last office back there in that office. And you know, you're definitely somebody that uh, I, I really enjoy hanging out with and, and admire. So thank you for your time. Thank you. I will start with uh, Craig LeBlanc. All right. Take it easy on me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we... They seem to have a lot in common, especially with your youth ministry and giving back, and that's kind of what I really wanted to touch on. You know, I feel like there is a bigger story of why your faith is such an integral part of your business and your life. Maybe give us a little background of where that came from. Who? Uh, <laughs> man, you're not going to make me cry, are you? <laughs> so um, they won't come through in the audio. I don't so, think. <laughs> so um, yeah, my uh, I grew up in a church and in, in a household that went to church. And um, didn't really go much beyond that. But I did have a dad who died in 1994 that um, I can remember as I was coming in late nights in high school and doing whatever craziness I was out doing, and there was a lot of craziness. He would be up at night reading the Bible. And uh, St. Francis of Assisi said that you preach the gospel every day and you work, use words when necessary. And that's exactly what my dad was doing, was preaching the gospel when, when he was doing that every night, faithfully. So anyway, he died, and I went on and, and made lots of mistakes. And uh, had a rough, I had a really rough childhood, not childhood. I had a great childhood. I was born into a, a wealthy family, uh, but we lost everything when I was, uh, when I was 12. And so I started working, and I worked my way through high school and worked full-time job to help pay for the private school that I was going to. And there were a lot of difficult times in high school. My father was bipolar. My mother and father divorced. He was in, in, in and out of an institution with his sickness. And all of the people that were my friends in high school, not all of them, but a lot of them, when all of this happened, weren't real kind, but uh, but the potheads were nice to me. So I, I started smoking pot, and that one thing led to another, and got into drugs, and just got was lost. And uh, well, fortunately, was able to graduate, and through work ethic and 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 working and some good mentors, I was able to ditch most of that, but still had a little issue smoking pot and being lazy and. <laughs> Anyway, that's uh, was very fortunate to kind of get out of that, but struggled with it a lot. And so I guess the point of telling you all that is that I was lost. God had his hand on me early on, but I was lost. And so I started this business when I was in my tw- late 20s. I started my first business, and it failed miserably. 
And that's that's one of the reasons I, that that I'm doing what I do now is because I was so terrible at being an entrepreneur. I wanted, I had the heart, and the desire, and the drive. And man, I could go out and sell, and I could I could get my product out there, but I sure didn't know how to handle any of the the business end of it. And that business failed, and there were a lot of things that happened when a business fails. People lose money. You owe people money that you can't pay them back. There are relationships that are damaged. Some of them are destroyed. There are, in my case, there were several near brushes with legal problems. (laughs) And not to get into too many details, but I dodged a lot of bullets. And I remember the day that the business failed, I went home and... uh, I sat there with my wife crying and you want to talk about feel like a failure you know you 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 just I I failed and I went back in in the bedroom in our spare bedroom and I got on my knees and I said God help me I, I knew where to go back to and I've tried to do this my way and I failed and I I don't know how I'm going to get out of this mess just help me please I'm from this day forward I'm yours and um, I'm going to fly straight. And I and, you know, woke up Sunday morning and said, come on, let's go to church. Didn't even know why I was going to church. I just knew that's what I was supposed to do. And um, the rest is history from there. I mean, my, my life profoundly has been impacted by that decision. So I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing. I wouldn't have the friends that I have. I wouldn't have the testimony or the story. And so, so there was a natural, a natural inclination to be involved in youth ministry because there wasn't much that they've seen or done that I hadn't already, <laughs> that I hadn't already been through or done, and uh, kind of walk the walk before. Yeah. So, uh, so anyway, yeah. You know, let's speak to the audience for a second, gentlemen. Most men in Chris's position uh, show their strength, but they're never really truthful and vulnerable about what it took to get there and the suffering and, and show you that, or they're very quick about it and just say, yeah, it was tough. But it's rare that you get someone that just lays it out on the table because you're going to fail not where you're strong, you're going to fail where you're weak. And you really need to understand those weaknesses as clear as you can before you hit that wall because otherwise you're going to find yourself broken in business or in life or in marriage, and, and, and then you'll have to pick up the pieces. And so thank you for sharing that with us, sure. Chris. I know that's going to be... Valuable for our audience. One of my questions I'd like you to, you pretty much just answered, but as a general question to just build a case for this, why give back? You know, tell our audience, why should you give back? Defend, okay. defend that cause <laughs> for well, a second. <laughs> so, uh, so I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to steal Dave Ramsey's material because I don't have a better way to, to explain it. So... In Genesis, and this isn't Dave Ramsey's material, it's in the Bible, but, but it's his uh, Lesson 9, The Great Misunderstanding in Financial Peace University, talks about this. In Genesis, we're made in God's image. So whatever that means, but, but just kind of stew on that a little bit. And then in John chapter 316, For God so loved uh, the world that He gave His only Son. And so... You know, we talked a little bit earlier, you've got nine daughters. That means you've got two sons. Right. And so I want you to picture that little three-year-old snaggletooth kid running down the stairs with his blanket when he gets in your lap in the morning. And I want you to picture giving that and sacrificing that. So God is a giver. And uh, if we're made in God's image— Something happens to us when we give. Something happens inside of us when we give, when we, when we become generous. And, and if, you, if you don't believe it, just go try it. Go, go anywhere and, and find somebody and bless them and watch what happens. Watch what happens in their life. Watch what happens to you. Watch how you feel. And uh, there's really no... There's not there's no other blessing that's more powerful than that gift of giving. Yeah. And I and I, I don't really know I mean, so that's the answer. Right. Why give? I mean I 
Why, why specifically, or what, is, what kind of pulls you towards the youth as far as helping them out? Oh, I don't really know that I help them. <laughs> I mean, back in the back several years ago, I think I probably had some that liked me. They don't probably like me as much now because I'm older and grumpier. But, um, you know, a lot of them, and, and just like I was, I was lost. And a lot of kids, they struggle with things and, and they, they don't talk to their parents. Most of them don't. And, I mean, the gift of having a... Uh, non-parental role model or trusted figure that they can talk to is invaluable. And it gives them a gift that can impact them for the rest of their lives. And I don't know that I've ever impacted anybody for the rest of their lives. Uh, I do have several that I taught Sunday school to that are now my beer drinking buddies. But... (laughs) I, I, you know, I don't know. I, and it's what's funny is when I got involved in youth ministry, when uh, George Ragsdale asked me to, if I would, we were at a crawfish boil. I'll never forget it. Sunday school crawfish boil. I had a cigar in my left hand and a cold beer in my right, and I was stirring a pot of crawfish. And he said, you know what? Our kids, kids in our church would love to hang out with you. <laughs> and I turned my head. I looked behind me. I was like, you, t- you, you wait, you talking to me? And um, looking back on it now, he was just trying to recruit people for youth ministry. But I, you know, I, I, so I was like, I'll give it a shot. And it was, re- it was the strangest thing. I never in a million years dreamed that I would enjoy youth ministry, that I would be good at it, that I would, you know, never even crossed my mind. And to this day, that's a part of my life that I can't imagine what it would be like without it. And I, I just think it's because I've, I've had, I've got such a story of redemption. I've got, I've got the story that, you know, God uses all the people in the Bible that you wouldn't expect that he would use. And I'm just one of those unruly characters. And, um, for whatever reason, that's where I ended up. So I don't know if that answers your question. No, that was good. Okay, so let's talk to those entrepreneurs that have or are currently where you were at. At, at your low points, their business is failing, they're suffering, you know, maybe it's affecting their marriage or their faith. Let's speak to those guys for a second. How do you pick yourself back up? You pick yourself back up. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know... Having a testimony is a wonderful thing, but getting that testimony is a pain in the butt. And um, when you're sometimes when you're in the middle of the story, it's hard for you to see the end of the story. And just just realize, number one, I would say, if you are a person of faith, and even if you aren't a person of faith, consider being one. <laughs> if you if you live your life that way, and you make that the priority, and you learn that you're really not in control of anything, and you just give it up. There's a weight that's lifted off of your shoulders when that happens, when you just give it up and you say, I'm, I can't control this. And uh, I think that's the first step is to give it up to God. Now, you know, give it up to God doesn't mean you don't do anything. You, you pray like it all depends on God and you work your butt off like it all depends on you. But I, I think that's the first step. And, and the second step is that it's okay to fail. I have, an, I have somebody that works with me in my accounting group, and she's always, she's in her mid-20s, her name's Kenan, and she always talks about, uh, you know, she doesn't like to fail. And I, I have this little picture of Yoda that I text her every now and th- every now and then that says, the master has failed more times than the beginner has ever tried. Wow. And... Um, <laughs> Go Yoda. So, uh, you know, <laughs> hmm, succeed your will. <laughs> so, so, you know, that's, that's, uh, it's okay to fail. I mean, I, and, and look, I don't, I'm not sitting here in front of you guys saying that I'm some big success story here. I mean, I'm, we're still a little small business, but, but I wake up every day. I do something that I love to do and I serve people and I figured out a, a way to make money doing that and to make a good living doing that. And that's, that's successful to me. I, I love what I do. It's not work. And I'm standing on a mountain of all of my failures. You know, if you're failing, but, but you know, the thing is, is that I failed 
and uh, and I failed more than once. But you just got to keep trying. Go back and look at all of uh, look at all of the the people that have been successful. Look at Sam Walton. There's a great quote by Michael Jordan. I don't know if you guys ever heard the Michael Jordan quote. I'm going to pull it up for you here. This is a great quote by Michael Jordan. I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I've lost almost 300 games. 26 times I've been trusted to take the game-winning shot and missed. I've failed over and over and over again in my life, and that is why I succeed. That's a big one. Okay, so I sense that there's might be an 800-pound gorilla in the room, and I want you to kind of tell us a little about it. But Okay. Uh-oh. I feel like there's a certain sense of strength that you get out of your marriage. What would your wife tell us about you if she were here? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, that's a loaded question. I don't really know, to be honest with you. The first thing she'd do is set me straight. <laughs> uh, Zig Ziglar talked about his wife. I like, there's an interview with him where he's, you know, behind every man, there's a strong, a strong woman. And, uh, and, and I feel this way about my wife that, that, you know, if she ever leaves me, I'm going with her. <laughs> and, and, uh, that's a good one. I don't know. I mean, she, she keeps me straight. She holds me accountable. I'm not always the best husband. And, I, you know, I married up. I don't really, um, just like in my marriage, I probably don't have the words to adequately say what I need to say. I'm, I'm not always the best at, um, at vocalizing that. But, man, she's been uh, through this whole thing. She's been there during the worst failures, the, the low points. You know, Bonnie Bonnie Raitt has a song, uh, Everything We Got. Is it Bonnie Raitt or is it Mary Chapin Carpenter? I always get them confused. But Everything We Got, We Got the Hard Way. And uh, that's our story, man. We're, um, we, just, we just started with nothing. We still have nothing because we have two daughters. But <laughs> <laughs> they keep that. <laughs> they, they, uh, we have plenty to spend on their stuff. Uh, but, no, she's... Um, She's it, man. I don't really know what to say other than that. She's just solid, and uh, she's beautiful. She's in wonderful shape. She she's healthy. She makes me feel bad when I eat fried chicken and mm-hmm. chocolate pie, and it's just just I can't imagine doing life with another person. Wow, powerful, powerful. I, I recommend if you want to start a great business, first marry well, uh, because you're going to need her when things get tough and they will yeah Chris man thank you that was one of the one of our good ones uh, it's very authentic thank you for sharing a lot of that, that real message that so many of these young guys need to hear stepping into this world of entrepreneurship appreciate all you said good right. message thanks for having me thanks for letting me say it fantastic <laughs>